children are going to be staying with us in worship and worshiping with us today. On this Christ the King Sunday, our scripture lesson is about Jesus' encounter with Pilate. Our scripture lesson comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 18, verses 33 through 38a. Would you hear now the word of the Lord? Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So are you a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, what is truth? This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Almighty God, ruler of the whole universe, we thank you for Jesus Christ, our King, the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. Enliven our hearts and our minds, our wills today, that we might be fully dedicated to you, our Lord and King. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Amen. Are you the king of the Jews? Pilate asked Jesus during this hurried trial that would lead to Jesus' execution on the cross. And Jesus, God in human flesh, does not give Pilate a straightforward answer to his question. The question, of course, is more complicated than it appears. Jesus is indeed the cosmic king over all things, including the Jews. Yes, he is. But is Jesus trying to wrestle away political power from the government headed by the emperor and Pilate? No, not at all. So when Jesus finally does give a more straightforward answer in verse 36, it still isn't that straightforward to Pilate. Jesus says, my kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Now this answer doesn't satisfy Pilate either. Pilate, after all, knows what a king is. Pilate knows how to play the political game. He knows how to play it in private. He knows how to play it on the big stage. He knows what it is that a king does and how people get power. And Jesus just isn't making sense. Jesus isn't fitting the bill. Why aren't these people fighting if Jesus is a king? So Pilate there makes the only decision that he knows how to make, which is to make his political calculations, decide what will be best for him, give in to his constituency that wants Jesus dead and orders his crucifixion, but not before Pilate, intrigued by Jesus' I'm above it all attitude. Jesus' claim to be the very voice of truth and to be born for that reason before Pilate, with some weariness and some cynicism and some genuineness, too, asks, what is truth? Jesus does not fit the bill for being a king by the world's standards, which Pilate sees, and yet Pilate has him executed for that very reason of claiming to be a king. Fitting the bill for a king, after all, would be somebody who is ready and willing and able to play the political game, to gain power, to fight for it if necessary. They were, after all, in Jesus' time, still living in the shadow of the greatest king the world had ever known by the world's standards. A good king in their minds was like Alexander the Great. 
the Macedonian king who by the age of 30 had conquered most of the known world, had never lost a battle, had taken his small Greek state to be an empire that reached all the way to India. Alexander was a model for what a good king, a good emperor would and could be. Alexander was the guy who, even though he was Greek, had a battle elephant with a collar around it that proclaimed Alexander to be the son of God. This is what a king did. They did something important. They transformed the world. After all, Jesus and our New Testament, well, they were speaking and writing in Greek because of Alexander's conquest all these years later, and everyone knew what it meant to be a king, to take power in this Jesus. This Jesus, pitiful as he is, people claiming he's the king, and yet with no one who is fighting to keep him from being arrested by this little sect of religious leaders. How could he be a king? And if Jesus doesn't fit the bill, then how is it that 2,000 years later we're still talking about him being a king? And yet we are. And somehow, in some unexpected way, centuries later, the movement that Jesus started would indeed topple the Roman Empire. It would spread throughout the whole earth, much farther than India, and Jesus would end up being a much bigger deal than Alexander the Great. And Jesus, all this would happen despite the fact that this obscure Roman politician would hand Jesus over to the death penalty, and Jesus and his followers would put up no fight except for Peter, who tries to cut off the guy's ear, and Jesus just puts it right back on. Jesus didn't play the game, didn't act like a king, and yet his effect on us has been greater than any other person. And so if we are to say here in 2021 that Jesus is our king, that Christ is the one who is Lord over us and of all the earth, what does it mean, then, for how we live? If our king does things differently, what does that mean for how we live as well? You see, we often talk about, we know in life, right, that there are certain things worth fighting for. We can come up in our minds what they might be, can't we? And yet here in this most important incident, all about this most important thing, Jesus, the very Son of God, come to bring his kingdom, and Jesus names it that because his kingdom is not of this world, that his followers aren't fighting for him. No use of force. Does this mean, indeed, then, that there are some things above and beyond all of the things we love to fight about? Something more important, more real than all the things that divide us, that we try to be right about, that we fight over? Is there something bigger? Maybe the most important things in life aren't the things that we are willing to fight over, but maybe the most important things in life are the things that we should be willing to live for, to sacrifice for, to die for, and in Jesus' case, and in our case as well, to live again for. Jesus shows us as king that the most important things are worth living for day in and day out. The most important things are worth sacrificing for, which Jesus shows us in his ultimate act of self-sacrifice, going all the way to the cross for us. The most important things in following our king, they're worth living for day in and day out. They're worth sacrificing for. They're worth dying for. They're worth living again for. And sometimes those can be big, dramatic things that cause us to lay down our own lives and to do something totally different. Sometimes God calls us to do big things, like uh, Hannah shared with us earlier, and go and be a missionary in another country and serve people there. And sometimes the sacrifices that God desires of us are the way that we live our life day in, day out, day after day. 
And so when we talk about Jesus being our king, I think it's an appropriate day that today is also the day that we're talking about the commitments we make. Many of you got these commitment cards in the mail. There's some in your bulletin. Maybe you brought one ready to turn it in. Maybe you haven't thought about it at all and you need some time. But when we think about Jesus being our king, we think about the commitment, the way that we live, the way that we live differently than we expected to live because we have met up with this Jesus and somehow by his self-sacrificial love, he has changed everything. So when somebody joins the church, when we ask them to make a commitment, commitments are important. We ask them if they'll be loyal to Christ, loyal to our king. We ask them if they'll be loyal to Christ through the United Methodist Church and through this congregation, and if they'll do all in their power to support it with their prayers, their presence, their gifts, their service, and their witness. Now, these things may not be the end-all and the be-all, but they are ways in which we show a commitment to doing life differently, doing it Jesus' way, believing that God can turn things upside down for us. And what shows faith in a world that could be different more than committing to praying? Committing to living that sort of prayer that we pray that God's kingdom would come and God's will would be done. Just having a real relationship with God where we pray, where we stop and pause. We're asking you on those cards if you'll commit to doing that at least three times a day. Stopping, pausing, praying, making your relationship with God. To the world, it may be talking to the air, but to us, it's talking to the very power who behind the scenes can shape and form and make all things new. Our prayers, our relationship with God, our reading, the scriptures, our turning to him, we're asking you, commit to at least reading three verses a day. It's just a little bit, but it's a start. It's a start to opening ourselves up to God's way, to having our very selves formed and shaped by this way of God that is different. When we pray, we believe in Jesus. This Jesus who went to the cross and the world thought it was over and became the biggest king ever. And somehow, some way, Jesus works through little things like our prayers and changes the world. So we commit to serve God with our prayers and our presence. This is another thing that Jesus shows us as our king, what it means to be present. Jesus, who was Almighty God, who did not need to come and be with us, but Jesus, because God so loved the world, chose to come and live among us and be present with us. There's something powerful about being present with someone isn't there. And God calls us, we call us together as a church to be present. To be present show up to be there for people to make it our commitment to be present not just when it's convenient sometimes it's sacrificed of other things but to be present and being present is more than just being in a room isn't it jesus could have come and lived in the world and not done anything nobody could have known him but being present is also being willing and able to be known by others and to really know people. To be really present in a room is to be willing to share about yourself and have other people really know you and to in turn really know other people. It's what happens in Sunday school classrooms and small groups and student ministries and children's ministries and where these real relationships take place. To be present over and over again, to be known and to know others, because somehow in the midst of that all, God uses it powerfully, just like God used Jesus' presence with us powerfully to change and shape the world. So we commit to our prayers, our presence for our King, and our gifts. The most important things are worth living for day in and day out, are worth dying for, are worth sacrificing for. And we remember that God's greatest gift comes to us in Jesus Christ, that God gave us a gift that didn't have to be given in Jesus' sacrificing himself on the cross, as Romans says, while we were yet sinners. 
While we were still enemies of God, God gave Jesus to us out of love. And in turn, we give as well. There's a lot of ways we can give. We give of our time, of our energy, of our very selves. We often talk about giving of money because money can be a big thing that shapes and guides and directs our lives. And a part of our discipleship, a part of our sacrificing then is giving. Giving so that something beyond ourselves can happen. Giving so that God's kingdom can go forward. We commit to sacrifice in order to give. Our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service in a similar way. Service is like a sacrifice as well because it's something we don't have to do. Nobody makes us serve our neighbor, and yet this is Jesus' example for us. And so we sacrifice our time and our energy to do all the things that need to be done. We sacrifice to come and be and volunteer with children and with youth. We come and sacrifice to pack those backpack blessings or to pack those meals that we give out on Wednesday night or to show up and work on committees, or to show up in other places in our community and love on people and change lives. We serve because the best things in life are worth living for and worth sacrificing for. And as we love and serve others in our King's name, we serve. We commit to our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness. Our witness, the very way that we live, our whole lives wrapped up, day in and day out, the way we treat people, the way we love people, the words that we speak, the words that we don't speak, the invitations we give to people to come and join us at church and come to lunch afterwards with us, the invitations we share with the way that we live and the way that we talk and the way that we share our faith, well, it's often a sacrifice, and yet the most important things in life Jesus shows us are worth sacrificing even ourselves for. And so today we follow Jesus, who is a king, whose kingdom is above and beyond our world. A Jesus who can be so confounding because he doesn't follow all the patterns that we thought were the way that you got ahead in life. A Jesus who's the greatest king, whose truth is, is that greatness comes through service and humility and being giving. A Jesus who forgives and loves his enemies. A Jesus who calls us to follow as well. So often we find ourselves like Pilate, not sure what to do with Jesus. A little bit weary of trying to play the game of life. A little bit cynical because we've been trying to play the game of life. And yet asking the very question out of genuine hope, what is the truth? And the Gospel of John also reminds us what Jesus says. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And if we are to find that life that's worth living and dying for, worth sacrificing for, worth living again for, then it will be because we have met Jesus, the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, for your presence with us, we give you thanks. For the surprising way in which you have transformed the world and transformed our lives, we thank you. Help us to commit to those same practices of living day in and day out, of dying to ourself, of sacrificing for the sake of your kingdom, to living with the hope of life eternal. Grant us grace, we pray. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Brothers and sisters, if you've come today with your uh, commitment card filled out and ready to go, I invite you to come and leave that on the altar railing. During this last song is a sign of your commitment. If you still need to fill one out or you want to fill one out, there's one in your bulletin. You can do that now or you can mail it in or later or you can fill out the form online later or you can make your commitment in another way. Um, There's a lot of ways to do it. But I want to invite you during this time as we sing together.
Stand up, stand up for Jesus is the song. I invite you to make that commitment to the one who is our king. Let us come before our king now. Our children also have commitment cards that they've been working on. Um, They're orange, and they're going to bring those uh, forward as well as we sing. And so let's together commit ourselves to the work that's worth living for, worth sacrificing for, worth dying for, worth living again for. Let's stand together and sing.